Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Disrupt the Way We Design, Construct, and Maintain the Built World, sponsored by United Academy. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you will be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today will be Curtis Rogers. Curtis is a construction technologist and partner at venture capital company Brick and Mortar. He brings diverse experience and feels equally comfortable in a boardroom on a construction site wearing an exoskeleton or running the Society for Construction Solutions. He holds a Bachelor's of Business Administration and a Master's of Science in Industrial Technology from Texas State University. Again, we thank all of you for tuning into this presentation. Curtis, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. I believe uh, we'll be going over a somewhat safety-focused uh, technology presentation today, um, as well as talk about what's going on in the broader uh, construction space. And uh, starting with, you know, who is Brick and Mortar Ventures and, and what do we do? Uh, so myself, I'm Principal Vice President at, at Brick and Mortar Ventures, and I work with uh, Darren Bechtel. Uh, so we're a a two-person team, uh, three if you include the dog, and what we do is make investments in early-stage companies. So the, the term would be a seed stage or a series A stage company, but these are you know, two or three founders, a very early product, a few customers, and we would be the, the first capital invested formally into the company uh, to try to make it into a, a corporation or, or have it acquired. So my background in, in construction, I really started out as a uh, engineer at Kiewit Construction, uh, rotated through the field, you know, laborer, foreman, equipment operator, surveyor, scheduler, and then after about a year, they put me in a role dedicated to new technology and process improvement, and uh, grew my scope of responsibility over three years to uh, a number of Kiewit divisions, and then moved out to San Francisco to work for an early stage uh, tech company, and then went to work for McCarthy Construction uh, for two years dedicated to process improvement and new technology. And uh, that was really uh, fortunate for me because at Kiewit, I got to learn how to build infrastructure and industrial. And then at McCarthy, we're doing hospitals and laboratories, utility scale solar. And uh, I got to see you know, a very uh, broad sampling of the, of the construction industry at various uh, points in the project life cycle, different project types. And then today, um, I am an instructor to the U.S. Department of Energy's Project Leadership Institute. So this is kind of a summary of the uh, construction experience I have that's, that's paid. So this is, this is what I uh, do involved in uh, construction uh, where I'm compensated. Um, my nonprofit that I run, the Society for Construction Solutions, I founded it about three and a half years ago. And I was living in San Francisco, and it was no one had organized all of the entrepreneurs in the construction space yet. So I sent out a survey to all the construction entrepreneurs out there, asked them, you know, what would you like in an organization? And uh, they responded that, yes, we're, we're thrilled to get an organization going. And now, fast forward three and a half years later, uh, we're an international organization with over 2,000 members. Um, the groups to get, get together in each one of those cities every other month, and there's no dues. Uh, if you'd like to get involved, just go to scscatalyst.org. There'll be a link at the very end of the presentation. And um, anyone who's interested in the 
evolving industry and what want to get involved in commercializing a lot of this new technology. And then uh, finally, as far as, as what we do beyond investing and uh, you know, supporting the community, uh, we're also co-hosting the NASA 3D Printed Habitat Challenge. And this is about uh, $4.5 million in prize money. And then the organizations in the top right there, we actually produce the competition in the event. Uh, you go to, or if you just do a Google search for NASA 3D Printed Habitat Challenge, or you see that URL down there on the left, um, you can learn more about this. But this is really the material science, engineering, and design um, for doing construction on the Moon and Mars. And one of the reasons why we're interested in, in being involved is this technology uh, will advance uh, the industry here on Earth as well. So we're learning a lot about computational design, a lot about material science, um, and a lot about autonomous and robotics and construction, which is really interesting to us, as well as um, this helps turn some heads and attract more talent into our space, because this is just genuinely cool and fun. Really getting started now in the presentation, um, you know, everyone knows that the construction industry is uh, not seeing the productivity improvement that manufacturing is seeing, uh, but builders are, are problem solvers. So what's holding productivity back? It's construction professionals are certainly not lazy. Uh, they solve problems all day. So what's holding productivity back? And why has it been that uh, telecommunications and finance and manufacturing uh, have advanced and seen these huge productivity gains, uh, but construction is, is really uh, not advanced. Uh, we believe that that is because of uh, solution scarcity. And we're in a really exciting time right now because technology has finally advanced to the point of addressing the unique challenges of construction information management. And until now, we didn't have mobile devices, or just recently. We did you know, 4G and mesh Wi-Fi, all of these uh, kind of technologies that are highlighted with these icons, these are just now becoming uh, economical uh, for the construction industry uh, to, to utilize. That's really exciting, as well as the uh, user interface design and the uh, business models and the uh, just the organizations that can bring these technologies, turn them into to solutions, and deliver them to construction projects. That's just never happened before. And that's the opportunity that our venture capital fund is, is going after, is you know, now is the time, and the construction industry is, is evolving. So how is construction evolving? Well, we don't look at construction as an industry, uh, but a common process among many industries. And that's how we see uh, construction changing. Is it's, if I were to look at it as you know, complex commercial you know, health care or you know, uh, mission critical facilities that are not designed for human occupancy, they're in the middle, or multifamily residential, multifamily um, or, or commercial projects, you know, kind of simple commercial, more just like office space. Each one of those verticals are changing in, in their own way. And for hospitals, the general contractors with the latest solutions and that can deal with all of the subcontractors and the multiple designers and you know deal with just the extreme pace of change that happens with a complex facility that's designed for human occupancy. It has a unique contract type and that will uh, dictate somewhat of the types of businesses and technologies that can be used in that space very different from mission critical facilities. So your data centers, your Tesla Gigafactory, there's no general contractor anymore. That industry, that vertical within construction has changed and they're direct hiring the subcontractors and the designers of those facilities are now in-house at the competitive advantage. So that category has just changed. It would be very difficult for a general contractor to be competitive in that space. And then we work in Katera. They're actively disrupting uh, commercial and multifamily residential uh, by doing vertical integration or with WeWork where WeWork has eliminated the general contractor and is able to manage their uh, international construction operations from New York. They were able to centralize, you know, the overhead that would charge, you know, 
3 to 5% for all their construction. They were able to bring that in-house and centralize that in New York. So as we see the industry evolving, here's you know, three examples. But you can look at the construction uh, you know, process as like a spectrum from you know, single-family residential all the way to complex you know, industrial projects, EPC infrastructure. Each one of those verticals is going to change in their own way, uh, but they're definitely all feeling um, productivity improvements, and uh, you see a lot of technology uh, bringing new capabilities. And number number one that is unlocking this this potential is the the leadership, and that's another kind of function of brick and mortar ventures. Is we get involved with corporations who want to to change. Uh, for example, my work with the U.S. Department of Energy, and they want to do their own digitization. They realize that they are at risk to being disrupted uh, in an industry that really hasn't changed much until now. And a lot of very capable, intelligent entrepreneurs see the opportunity, and maybe they're you know starting their own vertically integrated construction firm like Katera, um, or they're making a solution that is such a competitive advantage that an early mover could consolidate the space very quickly. Um, but really, it all comes back to uh, the leadership and uh, attracting and uh, retaining the right talent. Here's just some, a few examples of industry leaders that are, uh, we, we think, uh, doing what it takes uh, to be a part of this change. And you can see there's actually a number of uh, material and tool providers is you know, delivering material all the way up to the um, laydown yard is one thing, but being able to deliver materials and tools and equipment and everything up to the, the workspace is, is a really interesting idea. And then also a number of contractors with uh, Bechtel and Bill and Haskell, um, their corporation is evolving with these technologies. And then to Go from the abstract down into some a uh, little more details. Uh, just wanted to show you a few solutions that are uh, being used uh, to in these different verticals to bring uh, productivity improvement. Uh, starting in the top left, there's a number of design review solutions where let's say is that my team is reviewing a, a set of engineering drawings and each person needs to come up with their own issues. We call that a constructability log. Or I'm reviewing a proposal and I have my red lines and my annotations. You know, if my team all goes into a separate office, produces those comments, and we have to merge them all together and check the document, that's a very old way of, of doing things. Uh, but there's a number of simultaneous access solutions out there, like Bluebeam Studio or Drawboard Bull Clip or Google uh, Docs even, uh, there's a number of solutions that will allow multiple people to be in the same system simultaneously and collaborate live. And that eliminates a lot of the sawtooth back and forth between you know, the contractor and the designer. So we've seen that uh, really achieve the competitive advantage that people are looking for in the pre-construction phase. And then in bid management, this is a very significant change that's happening to uh, contracting, uh, which you know is basically what construction is, is contracting, is the contact database is now obsolete. And if you're familiar with LinkedIn or Facebook, you know there's not really much of a need to keep a Rolodex anymore. Uh, really what you want is a network where each node maintains its own contact information. So if I'm wondering where my friend is uh, currently working, I can go to their LinkedIn page and see that. Or if I want to do a search for a company and then find out you know, who an executive is, I can do that. Well, there's a new bid management system called Building Connected, and they have this architecture. And in the course of about three years, they went from two people to a team, I believe, approaching 100, and they facilitate over 80 billion contract uh, $80 billion in contracts every month. So the, the speed of uh, virality in these, these networks is really something to behold. And this is another pre-construction uh, phase innovation where if you're using your subcontractor contact data, uh, database, 
then you are really don't have the latest information uh, like all the, the customers at Building Connected have. It's like, you know, being on, on LinkedIn and, every, and uh, you know, everybody else is, or if you're trying to keep up with people on LinkedIn as far as networking, but you're still using a Rolodex, kind of a, a similar situation. Um, this is a summary of, of job site systems. So it used to be that the, you know, this being the cloud or any um, off-site data storage and this being the job site trailer or the job site office, it used to be that only people in this office had access to uh, systems. And now the people in the field, if this is the, the actual project site, uh, because of 4G and, uh, and Wi-Fi, really 4G is the real breakthrough technology, uh, everybody on the project site can have the information and access to the same systems as the teams in the office. And you really just need to bring the hardware in for charging. And you really can't underestimate the significance of, of this, call it IT architecture or configuration. And it's really a competitive advantage when you're talking about self-performed construction and getting more staff in the field, re reducing your um, craft to staff ratios and um, making sure you have the right information at the right time. Uh, companies that don't have this configuration set up yet are uh, definitely in risk of being left behind. And then field mobility, you know, iPads are great and smartphones are fantastic, but these uh, sunlight viewable uh, semi-rugged laptops are really what um, makes it possible for foremen and superintendents to spend time in the field while still being productive and uh, you know mostly Microsoft operating systems for the uh, for the corporations so these keyboards are definitely key but this is a big lesson learned uh, for me in, in my career of uh, helping uh, Keywood and McCarthy was the only viewable rugged laptops uh, or really a foreman's uh, best friend and the iPads are, are helpful uh, supply chain solutions so um, the leveraging the intermodal shipping network or having your uh, concrete uh, vendor um, give you some visibility into lead times on uh, how the batch plan is doing, how are my deliveries coming. Same thing with any permanent materials. Uh, there's another company called Manufacton which does prefab uh, and modular supply chain management. So if I have off-site prefab operations or modular operations, you know, let me get some visibility into the production lines of those operations and some understanding of, of where is my you know, near-term supply chain for the project. So a little bit different than procurement, but actual live data giving you intelligence on when is material going to be delivered on site. Uh, this one for reality capture, you know, you often see uh, a screen capture of, say, a point cloud or a 3D model or something like that. But really, with reality capture, what's exciting is the 360 photos are an incredible way to capture imagery for a very low cost per square foot. And then uh, LIDAR, uh, you know, part of really the survey crew is, is definitely a necessary thing and, and very expensive, but the frequency that you can capture these uh, photospheres is really something. And then we kind of look at everything in between is, you know, it doesn't necessarily do one thing, uh, one or the other very good. Um, then down here on the bottom right, uh, call this uh, rig guidance, but this would be retrofitting sensors and guidance systems onto heavy equipment. So this is a uh, drill rig out in West Texas, and these are uh, GPS domes, and that's a laser shining down on top of the Kelly bar, which gives the operator a depth gauge. And then this is an inclinometer, and uh, it's just helping uh, this old, tired uh, drill rig uh, to have a new life, basically, and uh, it's just a, a simple uh, retrofit. But this is somewhat of an early indicator of autonomous vehicles are coming to construction. If I can get lots of value from a guidance system and a depth gauge and better positioning, well, I'm just making this person's job easier. And the next step would be to put them uh, into an air-conditioned room, and they can just remotely operate the equipment. We're not quite there yet. But this is a, an early indicator that these types of uh, sensors and guidance systems um, are providing value and it, it just takes an entrepreneur to figure out how to 
you know, bring the cost down and make that either remotely operated or completely autonomous. Cool. So that was really the first part of the presentation. Uh, you know, who are we at brick and mortar? How are we involved with changing the industry? Well, what's going on in the broader industry and uh, some of the, the basic solutions that are taking hold now. Um, we're going to transition into some examples of emerging technologies and I want to encourage uh, questions from, from now on. So if you have a particular question about any of these technologies we get into, uh, please submit a question. I'd be happy to pause and uh, address it and we'll, of course we'll do a Q&A at the end. Okay, so this first one is a portfolio company of ours called Sirius Labs. And Sirius Labs produces uh, virtual reality uh, training as well as these uh, simulators. So in virtual reality, you see this is just uh, a normal kind of Oculus uh, headset unit. I can step into this uh, man lift simulator or this uh, kind of elevated platform simulator put on my VR goggles, and then rest my hands on the uh, equivalent of the OEM controls, and the actuators down here at the bottom of the platform uh, will give me force feedback as I work through the training. So this is virtual training simulations of operating heavy equipment and machinery. So you can see over here on the right is a crane simulator. So I have my foot pedals. Here are those actuators again. And here are the controls that you would find inside of a crane. So you're sitting here in virtual reality, and it's comfortable to be in virtual reality as long as you're getting some force feedback. And that's what Sirius Lab does really well, is allows you to get quality training for a very low cost and zero you know, safety risk. If, if you're just getting going, this is a great way uh, to learn how to use a piece of equipment before you're actually operating the real thing and putting yourself and other people uh, in danger as well as potentially damaging uh, the equipment. So that's what uh, Sirius Labs does and they work with a few partners uh, to commercialize this technology and sell it into the, the broader space um, as well as uh, machinery. So they can uh, give you the ability in, in VR to actually operate uh, machinery remotely or to, to run a simulation and, you know, learn what not to do, you know, pull the wrong lever and, you know, do quite a bit of damage to the equipment and simulation, uh, kind of learn the hard way with no consequence. Oh, I think I see, well, I have a question here, and it is, how do Sirius Labs uh, simulators replace real-world training? And it's not that they wholly replace real-world training, it's that they can accelerate the real-world training. And I know that there's uh, evaluations going on right now for the efficacy um, and to potentially get this to the point of replacing real-world training, but this is more about getting uh, more frequent and high-quality training when potentially you can't afford it or you can't disrupt operations uh, by doing as much training as you'd like to do. So this really is a complement to real-world training and a great way to centralize it and improve the overall uh, performance as well as uh, a great way to baseline uh, the quality of operators. So it's more that with this technology, you can have more training and have higher productivity and better safety because there's less barriers to doing on-site training. So it's, it's much more complementary. Now on to the next one. And here's a quick uh, poll. So I'll give you a moment to read this and uh, click through in the poll. All right, go on to the next slide. Excellent. Thank you very much for participating. Okay, so here's another one, and this would be in the category of personal illumination. So the Lumigear, which is not a brick-and-mortar portfolio company, what they do is they make this ring 
that is OSHA approved and just places on top of any standard hard hat and it has a task light so it replaces the uh, you know camping uh, headlamps that you may see on, on job sites and you know, uh, provides that some of uh, task lighting uh, as well but it also does a ring of light around the user so that's helpful for working above uh, ceiling uh, to just illuminate uh, your general surroundings as well as especially highway work or, or any uh, construction operation that really requires high situational awareness. It definitely is an active illumination rather than a reflective vest which would be passive illumination. And you can also communicate with this device over Bluetooth uh, to change its color. So if I wanted to have my different crews as different uh, Illumigator halo colors, I would be able to do that. Um, you can see that, that you can reason that uh, being able to change the color of workers on a job site would be an aid to communication. It might be really interesting for safety coordination um, as well as task management and some other things. So this is a, a really a great solution that uh, they're, they're selling really well. They're very reliable, um, and they have that uh, that long duration battery life. And they don't have a cord anymore, which is really a testament to the the quality of batteries. And a great thing to point to of this just wasn't possible, you know, five ten years ago. Battery uh, power just wasn't this dense. This next one is uh, SafeSight, and what SafeSight does is it's a, a software system, so think your mobile phone and, and think a website, but what the software system does is help you to graduate from a paper-based safety process to a electronic safety process, and then that data is used to develop a uh, risk score for each worker. So each person has an individual risk score, and you know that that's great. I'd love to have more information and, and more uh, actionable information about my uh, operation, and then you know identify you know who's a great safety leader and and where there's room for improvement. Um, but they have a really interesting business model, which takes care of the cost of the technology because they give you a discount on workers' compensation insurance. So what they've been able to prove, and they found partners to deliver this business model with, is if you use SafeSite's system, the insurance company will pay you to use the technology. And this is really exciting for all safety technologies, because all we have to do is prove the efficacy, the effectiveness, of the safety technology, and then the insurance companies are incentivized to cover that cost or to subsidize that cost. So SafeSite is really a workers' compensation insurance company, and using their technology is how they can collect the data to price a more competitive insurance product. Cool, we've got a question here from Alexis about Illumigear. So as an engineer who works in the pharmaceutical industry, would the Illumigear be safe to wear in a confined space uh, vessels? Uh, you check with Illumigear, but uh, I believe that's one of the key selling points for Illumigear is the, the use of confined space. Um, I, because it, yeah, so it's just a approved detachment for a normal hard hat. So it would be fine to wear in a, a confined space. Uh, you know, it's it's not off gassing anything. It doesn't, you know, it's not involved in ventilation or anything like that. Uh, this would be an approved OSHA uh, device to be added to any hard hat. So as long as you can wear a normal hard hat in the confined space, it doesn't require uh, any you know special uh, headwear that this wouldn't be compatible with. As long as you're wearing a normal hard hat, you can wear a Luma gear in a uh, confined space. Cool. So safe site, safety process management software, 
as well as workers' compensation insurance, and then other technologies as they're proven to improve safety, safe site and this, this business model can be really beneficial. This next one, if you remember when I was talking about reality capture, uh, this is the organization of photospheres. And Hollow Builder, you know, they, uh, a simple way to understand it is Google, Google Street View for construction. So if you've used uh, Google Street View to you know, walk around any street in the United States or probably the world by now, um, you can look around within this sphere and see this imagery taken at this point in time at uh, this location. And that's what Hollow Builder does is on this uh, you know, drawing sheet, I can point a location and then put a tripod in that location or just hold it by hand, this camera up here on the left, and then I can snap a photosphere in this location daily, weekly, monthly, however often you'd, you'd want to do it, and you can see it goes into a time series. And this is a technology that a number of companies are using to centralize a lot of their uh, oversight of subcontractors and centralize a lot of the inspection processes or at least make the inspector's uh, life easier. So up here on the left, you can see it's this camera. And about three years ago, this camera came out of Japan. And you can see it has these two hemispherical lenses. And that makes it possible to instantaneously capture one of these high-resolution photospheres. And I can flip through them at different points in time. And I can view it on any mobile device. And it's a very small file size. I'm not trying to render a big 3D model. Um, so I hope you, you're getting that it's a photosphere for one location over a period of time. And it replaces the uh, unorganized photos to document project pro uh, progress. Or I could take this for a facility and create a very low cost, easy to use virtual tour of a facility. And I can also annotate in here and um, organize my uh, warranty information, operations, maintenance documentation. I can organize whatever I want uh, spatially on a very uh, lean, small file size system. Now, what can you do with that data after it's, it's organized? Well, we're training uh, computer vision algorithms to detect change over time. So if I have this same you know, location shot with this camera every day, then I can train algorithms to go and measure uh, production rates. I can train another algorithm to look for safety issues or poor material handling or do an inventory of my assets around the job site. So that's one of the, the reasons why we're organizing these photospheres in the system is so that we can do uh, computer vision analysis of the data once it's properly organized. Another use which uh, we actually learned from a contractor in Poland is I can capture these photospheres and use it for safety training. So you can see here, instead of a, a drawing where I am uh, taking a photosphere in a specific location over time for tracking progress, now I've taken a uh, safety uh, training manual and I've captured a photosphere in the operator cab and then in each one of the blind spots around the cab. So what this contractor does is for anybody working on this job site, we'll take this web link for, for this hollow builder project and then they'll send this link out to the worker and they'll be able to look around within the operator cab and then click on each one of the blind spots and then go and see what it looks like to stand in that blind spot. So you're beginning to see how uh, this technology allows you to appreciate the safety risk without actually putting yourself at risk. Uh, so this is beneficial to increase the number of hours of training and increase the number of people trained um, using digital technology 
uh, as a complement to the in the field training. Like they're absolutely taking their new hires and walking them around the job site and showing them the risks. Uh, but this is a way for them to look at it on their own time, show their family. It's just a, a, a neat thing to, to look around and uh, interactive safety training. So back into the wireless space. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot from a video produced by UbiSense. So UbiSense is out of the UK. And what they do is bring you positioning systems for indoor use. So when I'm inside of a facility or I'm inside of a construction project, this is a GPS denied metallic dynamic environment and getting detailed positioning of workers can be quite an, an issue. And what UbiSense does is they make this uh, indoor location tracking system. This is the technology called ultra wideband. And you can see they attach these devices at these points around the operation and they can set up these zones. And of course, I can detect if someone or something is inside or out of one of these zones just by attaching a tag to it. But I also know the very precise precision uh, positioning of the person within this zone. So if I'm exposing someone to a certain level of risk and I really need to understand what's going on with that person, maybe it's, um, this is all a confined space and I really need to understand what's going on, or I've got a production line going, and I just need to know when something passes in and out of this zone. This is just one of those enabling technologies that allows you to passively collect data uh, from an operation. And this is another technology. It's two years old. Um, really, this is replacing the person standing there with a the clipboard uh, doing a time study. This is the, the technology that will make it possible to passively collect productivity data instead of having to do a time study and for the, the person or the process being observed to, to know that they're being watched and they'll you know, behave differently. It's called the Hawthorne effect. And this is, this is going to be a big enabler for improvements in productivity as well as safety, just the ability to passively collect this data and uh, you know, not have to collect the data firsthand. This next one is more in the robotics space. So this is uh, Kawazo, and I believe they're in Germany. And they are a scaffold material handling robot. So the scaffolding has this track on it. And this robot system, which you can see here, is able to travel up and down and over along the perimeter of the scaffolding. And it can do two things. It can bring you scaffold components, so the logistics of actually assembling the scaffolding system is improved. Now I have a robotic helper to bring me all the different components as I'm erecting the scaffolding. And then also, once the scaffolding is complete, now I don't have to use the temporary elevator for all my material movement, I can move material around with the help of this robot and alleviate that bottleneck a bit of that, that shared elevator for access to the entire building. So this is uh, really a, a material mover uh, for the exterior on scaffolding, which um, has safety benefits, also uh, productivity benefits, um, but big, big productivity benefit. and Erecting scaffolding is a pretty arduous process uh, as well, and it's always good to have uh, material uh, carried around uh, using robots and equipment rather than, than uh, individuals carrying it. And then here's a, a goofy photo of myself uh, wearing this uh, high dynamic range camera. So what you're seeing is Right here, the head-mounted display. So this is uh, like a deconstructed Oculus. And these two cameras right here are high dynamic 
range cameras. And you have one of these cameras on your smartphone. And it's really the technology that is balancing the light. So if I look at this image right here, and this one on the top right, and then below it, and down below it, really, this image on the left is a composite of these different images. So when I'm saying high dynamic range, it is a range of brightness that is being balanced in a dynamic you know, live video stream. And then now, my welding helmet has superhuman vision. I have a perfect balance of extreme bright and extreme dark in my vision as I'm welding. I'm not pulling my welding helmet up and down and making mistakes and blinding myself. Uh, this would have been awesome back when I was doing welding on industrial projects. And huge productivity improvement, big safety benefit, and also, because this is all being run through a computer, uh, if I was able to show the video, uh, I actually have a little helper uh, artificial intelligence system that is monitoring my um, speed of the weld or the, the bead and also collecting data that can be used uh, for uh, quality assurance and, uh, and you know, post-weld inspection is to, to really track the, the weld and collect as much data as possible. All right, so thank you very much for your time today. And on the left-hand side, you have the URL for Brick and Mortar Ventures if you're interested in uh, entrepreneurship. And then on the right-hand side, stscatalyst.org. That is that international organization of people interested in uh, new technology and uh, changing the industry. And now I'm going to answer one question down here in the Q&A and then uh, turn it over uh, for the formal Q&A. So uh, Brenna Brown, so uh, how do you keep them from being stolen? So I am guessing that you were talking in general about you know, this more expensive technology or maybe the uh, high dynamic range uh, uh, glasses in particular, uh, but really it's, it's no different from a expensive uh, equipment attachment or a welding unit or a generator or you know more pricey tools. Um, it you know there's a number of ways to prevent for these things to be uh, prevent from stolen. Um, there's a number of wireless solutions, but uh, there's a number of expensive things already on industrial sites and construction projects. Um, so I would I would see it as the companies that are using these technologies to their competitive advantage. Uh, they probably invest in security and uh, invest in uh, tool management and inventory control uh, to keep track of their assets. So uh, if you have a problem with um, things getting stolen, and this is a really good point, is that if you still have fundamental issues on a project, like things getting stolen, or if you still have um, problems with paper time cards, or you have some basic IT issues that need to be resolved, you have to resolve those issues before you can graduate to a number of these technologies. And I mean, that's what I did a lot with my time at, at Kiewit and McCarthy was you know, resolving these fundamental issues. If, if my project team can't buy one of these things because they're too concerned about it being stolen because everything else gets stolen, well, we need to, we're obviously motivated to solve that problem of things getting stolen. Uh, so I would focus on that uh, because if you can't resolve those, those issues, uh, you're going to really have a tough time uh, competing in, in future projects or uh, bringing any of these technologies uh, to bear if you're still struggling with basic issues like that. So now we'll transition over to the formal uh, Q&A. Uh, feel free to post a, a question. And then I'll look in my team chat here if I have uh, any questions I need to answer. Thank you very much. Excellent. Great job, Curtis. Thanks for your insights and expertise. Before we start the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input's important because it'll help us improve uh, future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. 
And then again, we remind you on the lower left part of your screen, if you wish to commit, submit a question and have not done so, you can, um, you can do that there, um, as we instructed at the, at the top of the webinar. So, all right, with that, let's get to some other questions. First, what is the leading technology for improving job site safety? Sure. Well, for the leading technology for improving job site safety um, would probably be uh, any graduating from any paper to a paperless process. And it's, I, I observed this back when I was in, in operations was you can correlate safety with just participation in the safety program. So doing um, your paperless uh, safety observations, uh, that can make it easier to track the number of safety observations, and that has a very easily identifiable impact on safety performance for a, a project. So I say right now it's the mobile apps and the uh, website systems uh, that are effective and are recognized by the insurance industry uh, to be effective in improving safety on, on job sites. Well, thank you. Kind of on a, on a similar vein, offshooting from that, what technology does the construction industry need to improve safety? Yep. So if, if there is a, a technology that's really needed, it's that uh, ability to passively collect data on every worker and to collect a, a leading indicator. So uh, if I were to get a notification whenever a worker falls or, or gets hurt or something like that, okay, that's, that's helpful. I definitely want to go and, and help that person and, and bring the resources to that person to take care of them. But a leading indicator that can prevent that uh, is really the goal. We want zero accidents, you know, zero near misses, all that, and collecting enough data to find out what are the leading indicators. You know, there's a a biometric called a gaint, and a gaint is really uh, the health of your stride, the health of your walk. It's kind of your posture, and that is a really interesting uh, potential leading indicator uh, to the fatigue of, of someone or distraction, uh, things like that. So what we'd like to be able to evaluate is can we completely passively, you know, wirelessly, understand someone's biometrics to give us a leading indicator of their fatigue, distraction, that type of thing to hopefully prevent accidents and prevent safety issues. So that wireless collection of biometric information is, is a technology that will, I think, really be necessary to get to zero accidents. Okay. Well, um, with that, we're not, we're not seeing any more questions in the Q&A box. So, um, we've run out of time. Uh, before we do close, though, we just would like to remind the audience, everyone listening in, that United Academy promotes innovating on safety and health solutions and works to bring emerging products to market, including the VR solutions from Sirius Labs. Um, with that, we uh, once again say that uh, we hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey, and that should be appearing on your screen now, and we do appreciate that as it allows us uh, feedback for future webcasts. And we do end now today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Curtis Rogers, everyone at Brick and Mortar and United Academy, and every one of you who listened in. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.